This video is brought to you by Aura. Hi, welcome to another episode of Cold Fusion. It's no secret that the world is plagued by scammers. Most of us are inconvenienced by their attempts weekly. We receive emails, texts, and calls from people pretending to be someone that they're not. From false bank account alerts to a message saying that a package that we didn't order has been delayed. Scams come in many forms. Some are simple, but others can be highly complex. While falling victim to a scam can lead to severe financial hardship for individuals, the fallout from complex schemes can cause widespread destruction. Such was the case for the people of Albania 26 years ago. In the late 1990s, Albania experienced one of the most devastating financial crises in modern history, and it was caused by pyramid schemes that promised a high rate of return investments. Two thirds of the entire country invested, but ultimately the schemes collapsed as they always do and the result was catastrophic. The life savings of many Albanians was gone, and this spiraled into an angry population, a civil war, and then the death of thousands. It's a wild and sad story. In this episode, we'll take a look at how this disaster happened and the lessons that can be learned from this tragedy. This is the story of how pyramid schemes destroyed Albania. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. Before we jump into this wild story, let me tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Your information is accessible to scammers, robocallers, and telemarketers because of data brokers. These companies will sell your information for a profit. Aura is here to help. Aura identifies data brokers that are exposing your information and automatically submit opt-out requests on your behalf. They'll even opt you out of junk mail and telemarketing lists. Aura also monitors your email addresses and passwords to see if they've been involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web. They also give you recommendations on what to do next. Not only this, but Aura's app also features a VPN, password manager, real-time credit and identity theft monitoring, internet parental controls, and malware protection. It's basically almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need, all inside one app, and it's a lot cheaper than getting these tools individually. Let Aura do the hard work for you and keep you safe online. If you sign up now, Aura will give you a two week free trial with my link, aura.com slash cold fusion. If it's easier, you can scan the QR code. It will also be the first link in the description. Thank you. To understand how a pyramid scheme could collapse a nation, it's best to start by understanding how they generally work. I've done a full episode on this, but essentially, Pyramid schemes are illegal investment operations that promise high returns but are designed to cause significant financial loss for those who fall victim to them. A small group or individual offers a product or service which they claim can generate high returns on investment. In reality, the product or service is often substandard or doesn't even exist at all. They rely on recruiting new investors to pay earlier investors, forming a pyramid shape. At first, it works. The new investors get paid, but not from the returns of the service, but from the money paid by new members. Although as the scheme grows, it becomes exponentially harder to pay everyone back. Eventually, the scheme collapses and this leaves the lower tier investors with significant financial losses and no hope of recovering their investments. But meanwhile, those who invested early and managed to sell in time stand to make a large profit. Sadly, these schemes are all too common and people fall victim to them daily. Sometimes they lose a little, sometimes they lose their homes and life savings. But on this occasion, a whole entire nation lost everything. In the wake of World War II, Albania fell under the control of dictator Enver Halil Hoxha. And this sparked four decades of communism in the nation. The Albania he ruled was one of widespread poverty and ruin, scarred by the wounds of war and Hoxha, an authoritarian leader, set to rebuild the country by any means necessary. In the early stages of his rule, his government outlawed traveling abroad, private property ownership, and the practicing of religion. Clerics, landowners, and peasants who resisted his rule were imprisoned, exiled, or even executed. But despite his authoritarian ways, the country did improve in some aspects. Increased infrastructure investment led to improved transport and facilities, and the country slowly recovered and began experiencing economic growth, increased industrialization, and urbanization. But even as economic factors slowly improved over the following decades, the heavy authoritarian hand of Hoxha continued to be felt. 
That was until 1985, when finally, the long-reigning dictator died. By the late 1980s, people had begun speaking out. Many citizens, particularly students, had become highly politically active and started to push back against the communist anti-religious state that had ruled over them. Thankfully for the people of Albania, the successor to Hoxha, Ramiz Alia, was a much more gentle leader. And following widespread protest, campaigning, and eventually a full-fledged revolution in 1989, Albania was on the path to electing a political party chosen by the people. And in 1992, Albania's Democratic Party was in power. Following decades of communist dictatorship, Albania began to transition into a capitalist country. It was a gradual process. The new government began to implement economic reforms, including privatising state-owned enterprises and liberalising trade. These reforms were designed to attract foreign investment and promote economic growth. This did lead to the emergence of a small, fledgling private sector. But the transition wasn't easy. Albania had been isolated from the rest of the world for many years. Infrastructure and external investment wasn't there, so it had a weak economy, and the government struggled to deal with corruption and the emergence of organised crime. But something much more devastating was coming. Under democratic capitalism, Albania was really struggling to find its footing. It was the poorest nation in Europe, and after decades of being under the boot of dictatorship, its citizens were desperately seeking to climb up the socio-economic ladder. At the time, Albania didn't have many banking and investment opportunities, and because of this, there was little financial regulation to be found, and this would play a huge part in the disaster. And moreover, these people were very poor, uneducated, and desperate. And most importantly, they had little to no experience with capitalist markets. And this all left the people of Albania sitting ducks for predatory investment pyramid schemes. And the pyramid schemes did arrive. They were operated by various companies, many of which were not registered with the government and were owned and operated illegally. The mafia, predatory foreign investors, and those who held influential positions under the communist system all saw the opportunity to take advantage. The investment proposals from these companies promised extremely high returns, some up to 50% per month. Of course, if you're financially literate, this is ridiculous, but to the people of Albania, it was an opportunity of a lifetime. The people of Albania hadn't experienced capitalism before, so they probably just thought this is the way that people in capitalist nations invest and get rich. While all of this was going on, the government not only turned a blind eye, but openly and actively supported these pyramid schemes, and this only served to increase their appeal. Government backed? With a 50% return per month? Sign me up. The schemes quickly gained popularity, and many Albanians invested their life savings. 25 firms held the majority of Albania's creditors. Of those 25, VEFA was the largest firm. They had 60,000 investors, and all of these investors believed that their money would grow at rates far exceeding what the banks could offer. The thing was, VEFA was actually a legitimate company. They had a chain of supermarkets and petrol stations, and their brand was on everyday goods, so they were somewhat of a trusted brand. The Ponzi scheme, however, claimed to invest in industries such as hotels, stores and factories. But of course, the returns that they promised were completely fake. The internet hadn't quite arrived in Albania yet, so it's not like you could just go online and really research the company you're investing in. The people of Albania sold their assets, their homes, their land, all to claim a stake in what they understood to be a safe bet, a life-changing bet. And by 1996, two-thirds of the entire population had invested an estimated $1.2 billion in these schemes. And this was 10% of the nation's GDP. You have to know that the average monthly income of the nation was $80 per month. Sadly, it would not be long before they discovered that their investments were unsustainable and relied on a constant stream of new investors to pay returns to existing investors. By late 1996, the schemes had reached their natural breaking points. VEFA, the powerhouse of the industry, collapsed, and this triggered a wave of panic among investors. It set off a chain reaction amongst all the major firms. As people panicked to withdraw their money, the other firms collapsed too. Many Albanians lost everything, and they were understandably angry. And then, a period of social unrest began. With large amounts of material possessions sold to invest everything, and having lost it all and having no way to get their money back, the country was thrown into chaos. 
the collapse of the pyramid schemes had devastating consequences for Albania. The country's economy was severely damaged. The citizens wanted compensation or even revenge. Everyone from farmers to police officers and soldiers had been ripped off and there was widespread poverty, even worse than before. Social unrest, riots and protest occurred across the country. Thousands took to the streets in every populated centre across the nation. Hunger strikes took place at universities. Initially, the protests against the government were peaceful. Everyone simply wanted their money back. But in February of 1997, government forces responded by firing on the demonstrators. This was the spark that ignited a civil war and the beginning of an uprising. Prime Minister Alexander Mexi resigned on the 1st of March 1997 and President Sali Berisha declared a state of emergency the next day. A week later, the Socialist Party of Albania appointed a new Prime Minister, but it did little to appease the people. By then, the government had lost control of the situation. The police and National Guards fled, leaving their armories wide open for looting. Militias and criminal gangs took the weapons, and the armories were emptied. 700,000 guns were looted, and the population was only 3.5 million. For months, crackles of gunfire could be heard as citizens were putting their new guns to use. Treasury buildings were robbed and destroyed. Armed gangs were formed, and it was every man for himself. This chaos led to a full-scale rebellion and a month-long civil war. 2,000 Albanians sadly lost their lives in this fighting. News of the situation began to spread around the globe. On March 28th, the United Nations Security Council sent 7,000 troops to Albania. This was to restore order and oversee relief efforts. In mid-April, surrounding nations launched a peacekeeping force to assist, and by late July, peace had been restored. The United Nations and other organisations continued to provide humanitarian aid, and a new government was formed through elections held in 1998. The new government faced many challenges. There was still widespread corruption, and now they had a completely ruined economy, worse than it had been before. But in time, eventually, Painstakingly, order and stability was restored to the country and it laid the foundation for democratic reforms in the following years. The Albanian Revolution was a defining moment in the country's history and the country would struggle with political and economic challenges for years to come. The Ponzi schemes that took down the country of Albania in 1997 had far-reaching implications. The population has actually been falling as citizens left for Greece, Italy, Germany, the UK and the US. As the publication The Conversation points out, there's been many empty ghost towns left in the wake of the disaster. But interestingly, since 2020, there's been a slight migration wave. There may be hope for the country as it makes strides in developing its infrastructure and improving its business sector. Although, of course, it still faces corruption and organised crime challenges. Albania has made significant political progress though. In 2009, the country became a candidate for membership into the EU. And to meet the requirements of the EU, they've had to do a lot of work, and this has been good for the future of the nation. But when all is said and done, the collapse of its economy and the resulting civil war is a stark reminder of how vulnerable we can all become when desperate and faced with the promise of a more prosperous future. It's also an important reminder to pay extra attention to any investment opportunity that you're involved with. So there you have it. That's the wild story of how Ponzi schemes destroyed an entire nation and caused a civil war. So thanks for watching. If you want more fraud videos, I've got plenty of those. Otherwise, there's other stuff on business in general or even science and technology. It's all here on Cold Fusion. All right, that's enough from me. My name is Dagogo and you've been watching Cold Fusion and I'll catch you again soon for the next episode. Cheers guys. Have a good one.